Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Is the mic? I think it's on. Yes. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, I am Vice President of Knowledge Enterprise Initiatives at ASU. Uh, Knowledge Enterprise is the research arm of the university, and you can think of everything from discovery to, to application, industry engagement, et cetera. Uh, most recently, I was Vice President of Research and recently made a move to Washington, D.C. So just for your reference, uh, anything imaginable in the context of uh, growing and diversifying our resource streams, collaboration, partnerships to continue to elevate ASU's research impacts across multiple domains. That's health, um, that's sustainability, for example, water, inter uh, clean energy transition, uh, space exploration, but for the purposes we're here today is also national defense and security. So ASU has been spending a lot of time thinking about uh, how we can really continue to grow and elevate our impact in a national security space, uh, align capabilities with um, mission pool, et cetera, and I think that extends specifically to the S&D Plus Alliance, and so everything that I said I just do for ASU, I think you can just assume I do as an extension of S&D Plus. So it's a pleasure uh, to be here today, and um, um, something we think about a lot is we can't have the impacts as a university, and I think S&D Plus can't have the impacts we desire to have unless we are partnering across many sectors that includes industry. And I think we're continuing to think about how best to engage industry and and what our value add is, and I think we don't know that until we have continue to have conversations with industry partners. So that's primarily the conversation today. And so I'll do um, our, our, our panel today is uh, Peter Heinemann, Hein Heinem, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Critical Technologies, Office of the Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. We have Chris Montferrett. Vice President of Maritime and Strategic Systems Strategy and Business Development for General Dynamics Mission Systems. And we have Ashley Snyder, Director of Australia, UK Emerging Markets, Mission Technologies H for HII, and she's also Chief Safety Engineering Assurance Officer for H&B Defense. Correct. Correct. Okay. So, uh, let's, I'll turn it over to our panel to give an overview, I mean an introduction and some opening remarks. Hey, thank you. Um, so first, um, um, the Honorable uh, Heidi Shu, the Under Secretary of Defense, um, regrets that she couldn't be here today. Um, uh, so um, I've been, uh, within, our, within research and engineering, uh, I've been the uh, lead um, for her uh, on AUKUS Pillar 2. I'm looking forward to the, the questions and, and the conversation that we're going to have today. Uh, I've been involved in Pillar 2 for uh, since about um, April of 23, so about uh, 16, 17 months. I have a pretty good idea of uh, where we are, what's going on, um, have opinions about what's working, what's not working. Most of it's working well. Um, so I look forward to the questions. I'm up. Chris Montferrat from General Dynamics Mission Systems. Um, first off, wow, uh, what a what a what a day, what an audience, and uh, uh, an intimidating uh, set of folks uh, to go before. I have not advised any prime ministers, um, <laughs> in case you're wondering, uh, but I have been in the industry for 37 years, mostly around uh, maritime and strategic systems. So I've worked in surface systems, undersea systems, and strategic deterrent systems. Uh, again, mostly in the maritime domain for General Dynamics Mission Systems. Uh, many of you uh, likely know General Dynamics Electric Boat, our shipbuilder. Uh, mission Systems provides mission capabilities to platforms like the submarines. So uh, within our particular maritime and strategic systems group, um, we provide uh, weapons, sensors, effectors, software, computing and integrate that onto those platforms to make them mission capable. So uh, that's kind of where we, where we are focused in mission systems. Uh, within uh, AUKUS, in particular, Pillar 1, uh, we provide the combat system for the Virginia-class submarines, the AMBYG-1 combat system. Um, and that uh, is also on the Collins-class submarine. So we've been partnered with Australia for over 20 years to integrate that combat system into Collins. Uh, and it's on Virginia now, and it will be the baseline system for SSN AUKUS as well. So a pretty good footprint uh, there. 
And then we also um, guidance and navigation for the Mark 48 torpedoes, uh, which are also used uh, in the U.S. and, and uh, Australian inventory. Uh, for Pillar 2, we're involved in key technologies for uh, hypersonics, uh, cyber, uh, mostly led by uh, our TACLANE product. Many of you will know about encryption and encryptors. TACLANE is a general dynamics mission systems product. And then undersea warfare, we are part of the C1778 uh, program uh, where our UUVs are down in Australia operating right now, uh, a 9 inch and 12 inch variants. Uh, so uh, we provide uh, UUVs as well as other undersea uh, te technologies that are relevant to Pillar 2. Thank you. Ashley. That's to me. So I also have not advised any prime ministers or anything like that, but I, I am a mom of six kids, so I feel like that's almost as important. Uh, <laughs> all right. You guys are awake. That's excellent. Um, so I've been 20 years in the nuclear industry. I'm an engineer by training and trade. Um, grew up in the environmental side of the house and then shifted over to shipbuilding with HII. Came into Newport News Shipbuilding 17 years ago. So I grew up in hard hat, boots, um, operating, testing uh, Virginia-class submarines. So um, career's been all over the place with nuclear engineering within the confines of HII. Um, I was tapped on the shoulder last July 4th weekend, actually, and said, hey, uh, we want you to come over and do this AUKUS thing. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm game. That sounds fun. Um, and then a couple months later, they said, what do you think, Ashley, about relocating to Australia? And I said, absolutely not. I'm pleased to tell you that we will be relocating to Perth next month. <laughs> so... <laughs> As things go, um, things have progressed in ways I was never anticipating, which is, I think, the story of most of our careers. But much like Chris, I don't work in the shipyard anymore, but very closely alongside it um, and been part of the stand-up of our joint venture with Babcock H&B Defense. I'm the chief safety engineering insurance officer there, so that's a, a new role, a new hat to wear, and a new opportunity. But HII has been all over the AUKUS um, agreement since the very beginning, obviously alongside um, Electric Boat, we're the two shipbuilders that create Virginia-class submarines, the two nuclear shipbuilders in the U.S. Um, so that's a kind of a responsible position there with, uh, with AUKUS and the Pillar 1 technologies. Um, as far as Pillar 2, we also have our Mission Technologies Division that has all of that um, C5 ISR, electronic warfare, space, autonomous vehicles, unmanned systems, which really we're bringing that, the rest of that Pillar 2 capability to Australia as well. So we've made some moves in the organization with who leads in Australia. Um, obviously, bringing talent from the U.S. system into Australia, specifically around nuclear. We did hire a new managing director for HI Australia, which is the Pillar 2 capability. We're part of the global supply chain team in Australia. So a lot of things have been moving and churning in the last year for us to be supporting AUKUS from, from all different angles. Thank you. I, I don't know if it was mentioned earlier. We were expecting Congressman Joe Courtney to join us, and he sends his regrets. Did you already say this? Um, he is, can't be with us today. He's doing what his constituents voted him to do, and I believe he is voting on legislation this afternoon and, and cannot make it. So uh, we're sorry that he couldn't make it, but he does send his regrets. regrets. Um, so I, I will open with the first question. What opportunities has AUKUS created in the defense industry and beyond, and how can companies capitalize on these opportunities? And I'm happy for this just to be kind of free association, but Ashley, would you like to start? Happy to. So um, AUKUS really puts a name to something that we've already been doing. I think it was mentioned earlier that it's 82 years of a partnership with the U.S. and Australia, and obviously through the 1958 Mutual Defense Agreement, uh, the U.S. and the U.K. have a pretty strong relationship with regard to one of our most sacred technologies, nuclear-powered submarines. Um, so this really opens up the aperture to build the industrial base of all three partner nations, um, <laughs> submarine displacement in tons, the, the demand for the U.S. system is increasing to levels that we haven't seen since the Cold War buildup in 1980. So, uh, you know, the displacement in tons needed for the U.S. system then was 100,000 tons. We just crossed that again in 2023, and we have almost an exponential growth pattern until I think 2030 is when we hit 200,000 tons, and that's just the U.S. demand for submarines. Um, when you put this into perspective with all three nations, then that increases the demand, but it also shares the wealth as far as being able to leverage all three nations' industrial backbone. 
Um, so this gives us an opportunity to share technology. It's, it's enabled ITAR reform to be pushed to the front and center. I mean, prior to this last year, I'm not sure how many people outside of our industry would talk about ITAR, but now it's on the tip of everybody's tongue. And now we have to go and operationalize how that actually gets done. So it just provides an opportunity for industry. Defense is a big industry here in the US, and we're able to pull um, other adjacent industries, whether it's mining or defense industry in Australia, uh, as well as the UK together to help benefit um, at, from a systems approach to uh, the capacity building. Chris. So um, Ashley and I did not compare notes before this. And <laughs> my, uh, my written answer is quite similar, but uh, I'm glad I, went I, first, then. I found as it gets later in the day, it's incredibly hard to be clever, uh, <laughs> especially when there's a lot of smart panelists that go before you. Um, but uh, I, I do believe what AUKUS provides is a structured framework around a set of technologies, competencies, and capabilities, right? Um, we all do foreign military sales, right? We all fight in that foreign market, and it's um, often a, a knife fight. But with AUKUS, there's very kind of clear, at least let's start with pillar one, there's a very clear defined market space roles, technologies, uh, competencies and capabilities that are necessary. So with that framework established, now you can get to the work of, of, of the real baseline is how do we uplift, as Ashley said, how do we uplift um, the industrial base in all three countries? How do we create capability and volume um, that supports all three nations in order to meet the shipbuilding challenges that we have uh, when you look at, again, trying to build submarines, nuclear-powered submarines across three different uh, countries. So I think that that is, is the biggest opportunity. Um, from our perspective, um, partnership is the key to that. It's partnership with government. It's partnership with academia. It's partnership with other businesses. Um, you know, you may think Electric Boat and, and HII maybe are competitors sometimes, but the reality is that we all know that we have to work very closely together uh, because we won't get it done if we're not partnering with everybody. Uh, there's just too much work to be done. There are too many challenges for us to be bickering amongst ourselves. And there's, uh, as Ashley said, plenty of work to go around. So um, the opportunity is, is great, uh, and, and the opportunity is great across all three countries. Um, and I think, as I said, partnering for Uplift, in particular in Australia, a white hot labor market there, right? So. Um, how do we find the workforce to come do the bidding that is necessary for AUKUS to support AUKUS, to support Virginia to start, and then translate to, you know, building SSN AUKUS eventually and sustaining those platforms out in time is going to take, I, I, I forget you said the number, someone said the number of 30,000 people or something like that that we have to add in Australia alone. So, uh, as I said, plenty of work to be done, uh, and it's going to take partnership. It's going to take a focus on the mission. Um, and locking arms and going and figuring out. So that's where the opportunity from my perspective resides. Great. So Peter. In terms of uh, just Pillar 2 thinking, uh, when Pillar 2 got underway, there were a number of working groups in the six areas that then Ambassador Rudd laid out. And within those, there were lines of effort. There was some work that's been gone, that's happened between the three countries, um, all of which is, most of which is done by industry, some by government organizations or it's in combinations of the above. And there are, th there are products of those uh, activities that are moved across to programs of record. So that's in the beginning phases. Now, coming from a, 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 coming from a DARPA and IARPA background, um, my, my, I'm an R&D guy, that's it. But so for me, R&D is project-based. So when I start it, I, I know who's gonna benefit if um, I succeed. I can put metrics on it, I can put timelines on it, and hold myself and hold others to account. And that's how I go to whoever holds the, the purse strings uh, to, uh, to achieve, to, to get the resources to do it. And then I'm seen to execute. Um, industry understands this, um, actually so do universities uh, as well. So as we move from working groups and lines of effort to project-based work uh, in pillar two, uh, I see, and I'm seeing inside the system, um, uh, ambition towards much more significant trilat projects. Um, and it's, it's actually very exciting. 
Uh, one example that the ambassador pointed out that's out there in public is something that we've called the maritime big play. Um, this is something that's going to occur with a, with a marquee event each year in the fall. Um, this year it's at Autonomous Warrior um, off uh, of Jarvis Bay um, in Australia. And um, companies have been bringing gear to participate in that in the three countries. Uh, it's been evaluated and tested. Some of it's been shipped uh, from here to Australia. Australia's bringing their own. Um, Brits are bringing their own as well from their own industries. And they'll be playing together and working together um, from the subsea to the stratosphere. So, and there's a sequence of these events year over year with increasing complexity, and not just in numbers, but in terms of the type of autonomy, the decision making, the operational control. Um, so that's, for me, that was the sign of a first um, real project, um, or project thinking. Uh, and now we're adding more to that uh, inside Pillar 2. Um, so it's um, pretty encouraging. The ITAR change, or the netless, e the ETL changes. I remember getting into AUKUS Pillar 2 April of last year, and the first things I heard from industry were, there's this ITAR thing, um, or EAR. And, um, and the State Department was in the room. They heard that. Uh, they led. And here we are now with the ETL, uh, revised ETL, um, pretty much final. And that's, uh, uh, for, for government speak, that's a little over a year. That's light speed. Um, this is a very important partnership, and it's, um, the signs are good. And then, actually, thanks for reminding me on Pillar 2, because I did what, what we always tend to do. We jump right into a discussion of Pillar 1, right? That's our I was going to say the right? same thing. Yep. Um, it's easiest to, to figure to out. Jump it. right there, right? Uh, but, but the reality, from an industry perspective, right now, it looks like Pillar 2 is moving more slowly. But the reality is the challenges there and the diversity of needs and, and gaps and requirements are going to create great opportunity in Pillar 2. Uh, I guess my perspective is we in industry, we need to be patient. We need to keep our ear to the ground as that evolves, as it comes together, and as the funding settles out and the requirements settle out. Um, because Pillar 1 is a big sucking sound right now, I think, in terms of, you know, budgets and things like that, but there are real needs and gaps and mission requirements associated with Pillar 2. And if, if you want opportunity in Pillar 2, continue to pay attention, keep your ear to the ground and be patient would be my, my recommendation. Yeah, mm -hmm. kind of similar to that. You, you both kind of sparked my thoughts. It's easy to get focused on Pillar 1. It's a submarine. It's a big black thing. It's, you know, that's the sexy thing right now. Um, but really, Pillar 2 is just putting a name to things that we already are doing. Um, for example, Unmanned Systems is, has our, we did a Yellow Moray project, so at the end of last year, we actually did a fully autonomous launch and recovery of one of our Remus, our Unmanned Systems vehicles. Um, now, it just so happens that all three classes of submarines, Virginia class, Collins, and Astute, have the same size torpedo tube. So when you think about interoperability and um, being able to open up the doors to communicate, then that would be one of those opportunities. What if we could extend that and we could launch from a US-based Virginia and then it could be collected by an astute class and then launched again and recovered by Collins? That creates this whole network that's much bigger than any, you know, the sum of all three parts is bigger than, than we are independently. So Pillar 2 really is the embodiment of that interoperability and, and the embodiment of being able to share things through the modifications that have been made to ITAR and, and other um, regulatory regimes. And so, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, some more. Uh, uh, so when we think about Pillar 2 and we say advanced capabilities, a lot of folk go straight to, that means R&D, but just R&D. So low, low TRL, low, te low technology readiness. But there's no, there's no constraint on that. And cer certainly inside the Pillar 2 space, uh, we have leadership by, um, a, defense policy, but then on the team working with policy, we have the joint staff, we have acquisition sustainment, we have research and engineering. And we're looking at everything from, yes, from some R&D, we don't have to do this yet, but there's real bench in the three countries, all the way up to acquire and deploy. So everything is fair game in Pillar 2. It's not constrained just to the R&D phase. Great. 
Charlie, when, when did we start? I'm just trying to get an idea of our time. So I'm going to derail it just slightly then, since we have a Peter, this might be from you. From your comments, um, you know, I think the academic community has a lot to offer in those lower TRL, pillar two, emerging technology space. And I think, I think S&D Plus, in, in our opinion, is a little bit ahead of its time. And what we notice is resources coming from, from the federal government to support trilateral projects. Mm -hmm. I thought, and if, if we want to save this to question four about future trends, that's fine. But I was just curious what your thoughts are. Are we going to see more resources coming out to support trilateral you know, lower TRL work across uh, academic institutions? So as, as uh, actually as Ambassador Rudd described, um, on, the, on the teams that we have working today, I, I'll leave it to you all to talk about Pillar 1, um, but in Pillar 2, um, with the universities, or with the industry elements that are there, universities are absolutely engaged in working with them. Um, this is a from, from a research, from a university research perspective, if you want to put something in the water, break it, pick up the pieces, and learn how to do it better next time, or to write the research paper for the next, or devise the next sensor, or the next PNT, uh, uh, position navigation timing device, we, we are doing those experiments. We're deeply involved in those experiments in some very different um, um, C domains. Um, so, pretty interesting. Now, if, for those of you who watch uh, in, the, in the US system, the budget process, in the present budget request for um, the coming year, there's a substantial line for AUKUS uh, Pillar 2 related activities in the research lines. Um, so we're, you know, we haven't gone, we don't have the final budget yet, and we're going through the process now um, to understand how much will be available. Um, but effectively multiply that by three or more because um, there, there's um, equitable or equivalent investments in the way these things work between the three countries in any of these activities. But universities, um, again, coming from DARPA and IARPA, um, yeah, that's where, that's where the real innovation happens. Yeah. Okay, I'll get us back on track. Um, how has AUKUS influenced the defense and technology sectors in US, UK, and Australia? Ashley, I'll start with you again. Okay. Um, well, kind of piggybacking off what Peter was mentioning as far as the universities really being a linchpin for all of this, um, if, you th if you think about it, global stability is really about deterrence, and deterrence is really about industrial capability, and industrial capability is really about having a workforce that can do the work. So whether it's making the widgets uh, with these small to medium enterprises in Australia all the way to assembling and testing and operating nuclear-powered submarines, it's all about workforce. And the partnerships with um, industry and industry are there and robust industry and government and, and the industry to universities is also a really important component when you're thinking about not just the R&D piece, so all, all sides of AUKUS, we need to have those industry partnerships. So I was privileged to be able to be part of that, working with University of New South Wales, Curtin University, and the University of Adelaide to form AUKUS Workforce Alliance to be really focused on that, um, making sure that the workforce is ready, not just from, from the R&D perspective, but just general nuclear capability, industrial capability. What kind of engineers do we need to be putting into the system? What kind of trades do we need to be putting into the system? And really building that industrial base from um, not just the university, but even before that. So workforce development is going to be a key enabler here in being successful. Um, and I think that we've, we've demonstrated that there is a desire to do that, and we'll just continue along that path, getting the right kind of partners in the right place to progress. Chris. Yeah, so I was going to talk about partnerships, but I won't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I would... Um, I guess I'm going to bring it around to risk, and it, it, it's a theme that I've got a couple of different places in, in my remarks. Um, you think about things like putting a man on the moon that came up earlier today. You think about launching a missile from a submerged submarine, from a submerged submarine, right? Uh, we were, the nation was able to, within five years, figure out how to cut a submarine apart put a missile tube in there, design those missiles, develop the fire control system and launch control system, 
and to throw those missiles through the water and get them on target accurately. And they did that in five years. We can't even write software in five years right now, right? We, from a risk perspective, um, things like that where there's a national priority or in this case a trilateral priority create the opportunity for innovation. They create the opportunity for changing your risk posture, right? So um, I guarantee you in five years to do that, they took a lot of risks, right? And there were a lot of things that could have gone wrong. And for NASA to put a man in space, they took a lot of risks and there were a lot of things that could have gone wrong, but there was a national imperative to do it. And I think that AUKUS is similar in terms of some of the things that we are driving at in the timeline. Maybe that it's not as um, bleeding edge technology, but some of the things we're doing like the ITAR changes, like security posture, like cybersecurity, right? There are great challenges and risks. And if we wanna do it in the time frame that has been laid out, we need to, we need to to lean forward into that. And that's industry, it's academia, it's government, right, leaning forward. And so from my perspective, I think it creates an opportunity for us to break some molds that have gotten very hardened over very many years uh, that maybe, you know, don't need to be as hardened as they are, right? Because um, you get into the habit that everything um, looks the same to you from a risk perspective and the reality is it's not, right? There's a risk management structure that you can put in place where there are low risk things, things where you can lean much more uh, forward than say a high risk thing and you don't, you don't compromise over here on high risk things, um, but you can compromise on some of the other things and, and getting back to the discipline of sorting that all out to allow us to move faster I think is one of the great things that can come out of AUKUS. Peter, do you have anything to add? In, again, pillar two, focus only. Um, in the industry's perspective, when people come, companies come to talk, um, the, the, the frame a year or so ago was, well, we have a subsidiary and in one of the other countries, whichever way around it might be, and we can't easily move information back and forth because of some of these rules. Some of those things, some of that friction is going. Um, so there were, there's the subtle changes happening, subtle from the outside, maybe incredibly important from the inside, but um, I defer to you. Um, and then in terms of what, uh, as we're looking at larger pillar two projects coming forward, that notion of co-development and co-production, or co-R&D, co-development, co-production of different things uh, is actually pretty exciting, um, especially when you think of the the stresses we're placing on the larger um, uh, military industrial base at the moment for uh, manufacture and procurement of systems and armaments. Great. So all of you have already touched on some challenges, but from your um, respective positions, what are the key challenges that are keeping you up at night in the context of the AUKUS framework and ensuring its success? Peter, I'll start with you if you want to. I won't be too blasé and say I, nothing Nothing does keep me up at night on AUKUS uh, Pillar 2, but nothing does keep me up at night on AUKUS Pillar 2. <laughs> um, things are moving in the right direction. Uh, again, we, we're moving to a focus on projects and bigger projects. The, the um, ETL publication, um, sea change, um, no, no pun intended. Um, and uh, I like, th and then there's some of the machinery in Pillar 2, the basic machinery in terms of um, acquisition rules um, work between the three countries. So if any of you do government uh, contracting in the US, um, if I do something, I have to do, well, I always prefer to do full and open competition. Okay, if I run a competition and I pick company X, company Y, uh, and you're one of the partners, can you just use that? Or do you have to do your own competition? Um, it sounds, if you're not in the, the business, it sounds meh, but actually things like that, and we have awesome partners in the acquisition sustainment business working on the, with us, working through these, running tabletops, um, trying to knock some of these things down before we run into them when we're moving much faster than we are at the moment. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a good moment. Uh, this is a good moment to, to be in the uh, orchestra space. Chris? 
Yeah, a, a couple of things, and I'll start kind of where I left off on, on the last, um, last response there. Uh, and this has come up a number of times with prior uh, panels here, right? Uh, export control, security, both cybersecurity and security clearances. Um, and um, making sure that you've got good definition of those regulations, right? So from a, the industry has their own risk management framework, right? There are things that we'll do, there are things that we won't do. Um, there are things that the governments need to inherently drive, things like security requirements, uh, things like cyber requirements, uh, security levels, right? What is a what is secret in the U.S. equate to? I know we do it well in the Intel community. I'm not sure we it's as clear in the DoD, right? How you uh, how you can translate uh, clearance levels across the nations, right? Those things need to be defined by the government so that industry then has a framework in which they can operate pretty freely. And that's cybersecurity requirements, it's security clearance requirements, um, and it's export control requirements. So great that we got export control moved to a different spot, but until it gets down to implementation, it's really hard for us in industry to do anything with it, right? We need to get to the implementation level uh, for that, and we do in the other areas as well. So that's, that's item one for me. Um, second, we've hit on a number of times is uh, the staffing and development of expertise, right, in all three countries. And in, in particular for me, it's a focus in Australia, is how do we get um, that capability stood up for nuclear-powered submarines and designing, maintaining, sustaining nuclear-powered submarines, uh, and where is that industrial base coming from, um, and, and the clearances necessary to put that workforce in place that they will need as well, especially as came up earlier in a multinational country like Australia, right? Which I think is, uh, is a little bit more challenging than we have uh, maybe in some cases here in the US. Uh, second, uh, or next rather I should say, is the speed of um, trilateral decision making. Now I know it came up a couple of times that there's some frameworks in place and um, governance rules in place, uh, but if that doesn't translate to speed and, you know, I don't know, folks experience, but generally, you know, large organizations like governments of countries uh, tend to not move really quickly, right? U.S. is moving quickly, more quickly than normal. Uh, but the reality is there are things in AUKUS, I think, that are going to require quicker decision making. So what does that governance framework look like and how can we use it to accelerate decisions um, that are at the speed of relevance, right? Because if you don't go fast enough on some of these things, you're no longer relevant. So. Um, that would be uh, one other item. And then um, the management uh, came up earlier as well. The management of the social contract, I think, is the other thing, right? In all three countries, how are we communicating this to the constituents? You know, the, working in the defense industry in the U.S., um, it's, it's um, somewhat challenging to, to listen to um, people who just don't understand why strong defense is important and why the investment in defense is important. And I think that that's multiplied by 3x, you know, when you look at all three countries and managing the kind of dollar investment that is needed for AUKUS through that and what does that, you know, social contract, what does that communication look like and how do we participate as part of the team in industry to help with that, uh, I guess is my, my last item. And, Hopefully I left you something to talk about. Actually. Well, you gave me a good, a good lead in. So for, uh, as far as timing and speed, that's that's the one thing that keeps me up at night. When, when I first entered the AUKUS arena, we had about 100 months until we needed to have that sovereign ready milestone. So conditions based milestones and that time has been eroded. Um, and for every month that we wait, the, the longer it's going to take to be able to transfer that knowledge and experience. So my previous role as a, as a nuclear test engineer, it takes 15 years to develop a, what we call a chief test engineer. So you've had a couple of boats start to finish that you've worked through. You've d done it as an under instruct. You have to have your nuclear engineering degree or some similar degree experience. And in order to have that first CTE in place and ready to confidently lead the test organization for the first major availability that the, the Australian flagged VCS boat, the first one we transfer, that will happen seven years after we transfer it, 
we got to start now. That if you work it back as far as timeline, that's 2025, that person needs to be started, identified, and doing that work. And oh, by the way, it's not just one person because we run three shifts of coverage because you don't ever just flip the light off in a nuclear powered submarine and go home. You have a whole lot of people that are gonna have to be there. So it's the time, it's the speed, it's the getting the experience. And unfortunately, like with most things, with me personally and many others, we learn things the hard way by doing it and doing it wrong. So we need to start getting that hands-on expertise. I know there's a plan for placements and embeds in both of our yards, but we really need to expedite that and start where we can, working with the things that we can do, just the general knowledge and information where we have it, that we can share industry to industry to get to accelerate that time to talent. So it's really about speed. We've, we've gone much faster than we have in the past, um, especially with something that we've spent our entire career doing this with anything nuclear propulsion information. No, you can't see it. No, you can't share. And now we have to unlearn, you know, 70 years of that culture, which we've, you know, really drilled into our employees and, and everyone that's involved in the program that it's very tightly controlled. And now we're asking everyone to undo 70 years of uh, policies, procedures, ways to keep that tight. So it's, it's a, there's a lot to unpack there, and we're working on it as, quite, as fast as we can, but even as fast as we can is not quite fast enough. And one other thing, I, I guess, along these lines that I worry about, right? I said, not all, thing, not all risks are the same across the program. Uh, not everything is equally hard, right? What we're trying to do here, as has come up a number of times, is incredibly hard. Um, we have a propensity to want to make everything really hard. And to make Offset Hawkins successful, we need to let the easy stuff be easy, mm -hmm. right? Don't make everything hard. There's some stuff that just is no brainer. Let's just go do it, yeah. right? Don't make it too hard. Don't overthink it. Let's just go do it. There's enough hard stuff for us to think about and worry about um, that's going to take time. So um, we're, we're seeing that now where there's something that's like, hey, we've been doing that for a long time already. Why do we have to rethink it? Let's just keep doing what we're doing. Well, it's August now. It says, no, we've been doing it. Let's just do it. So that would be the other thing I think is don't overthink things that you don't need to overthink. There's plenty of things to overthink. Those of you who are in the room that work in the academic space like I do, let's take that motto back to the academic <laughs> space. Let the easy be easy. Uh, I like that. What um, fun is that? <laughs> Uh, so final question, and then I guess time permitting, we can open up questions to the audience. But what future trends in defense and technology should the industry players be aware of as AUKUS evolves? Peter, you want to start us off? I'm wearing, again, the, so wearing the hat I have at the moment and previous hats in, in the IC, but always in the R&D space. Uh, as you say, the, the potential adversaries always get a vote. And or in this case, many votes. Um, and technology 20 years ago, or the leading edge, we had commanding positions in everything. Today, um, we talk about the democratization of technology. Great universities teach people from all over the world, and they need to, because that's how we get the new ideas. Uh, on the other hand, it's, it's much more of a level, level playing field. So the notion I use the term uh, the Red Queen uh, situation. We're running really fast um, in order to stay uh, in the same position. In some cases, in some areas, um, we're moving faster. And as Secretary Austin has pointed out, in alignment with the national defense strategy, uh, it's, our, it's our alliances and partners, partnerships that really are one of our superpowers uh, and the basis uh, for advantage going forward. So that's not just um, additional um, ge geography. That's talking about access to smart people, um, a deep bench in certainly the, the, the two, uh, two AUKUS partners countries. Uh, it's just tremendous. And some of the things that they have world leading interests in uh, and we don't. Um, so there's a nice complementarity just on the technical side. So that's... Um, democratization of technology that's um, on the good side access to uh, and partnerships with real partnerships uh, at all security levels um, for a deep bench of um, approaches um, and then in terms of specific technologies 
there's, there are some that we're doing, in, again, pillar two is my focus, uh, and we have, from the beginning of AUKUS, there are six areas of work. Uh, as you move to projects, we're not constrained by that. So wearing, wearing my, my day job um, hats for a moment, I think a lot about space and commercial space. I think a lot about uh, microelectronics um, and all the things that are going on there. We're involved closely in something called the microelectronics commons uh, inside defense, which is a, a $400 million a year investment uh, in uh, improving the rate at which we take great ideas from universities and small businesses from the laboratory where they've been proven uh, in all kinds of ex exotic technologies, not just um, silicon, all the way up to fabrication at scale and always focused on defense needs. So from, again, looking, stepping back from pillar two activities today, thinking about some of the other things that there's, again, back to this real bench in the partners uh, that complement ours, uh, I think it's, it's, it's actually very exciting, the things that we can get to do. Again, back to sufficient funding, back to the will uh, in order to do so. And as a, a quick shameless plug, I, I have to say that ASU was successful in winning one of the microelectronics <laughs> commons hub and hubs out of eight. Had to get that in. Uh, Chris. There you go. Um, <laughs> I think um, the threat is going to continue to evolve, right? It's, they're not going to sit still. And so the challenges and the mission requirements will continue to evolve. As the things that we talked about earlier, as cyber regulations and framework, as security framework, as um, ITAR or export framework comes into clear um, clear implementation view, right? I think the opportunity for collaboration to innovate will increase incredibly. And that's where I think the biggest excitement is, whether it's pillar one or pillar two, um, opening up this new collaborative environment where we'll be able to get cr n new innovative ideas uh, or feed off of each other uh, across, you know, national boundaries, if you will, because those um, restrictions have been uh, softened to allow us to do that. I think that's um, the really exciting space is as that uh, takes place, I think that we're gonna, we're going to expose a, a lot of opportunity and a lot of exciting um, technology advances that'll allow us to kind of track the threat. So, you know, watching what happens in the threat space and then having the ability to talk more freely about technology and about capability and innovate around that, I think is gonna be a really exciting space uh, like I said, particularly in Pillar 2, but I wouldn't be surprised if some of that also found its way into Pillar 1 as well. And this is, so this is part why it's um, so valuable for us to have the joint staff and their equivalents deeply involved in the Pillar 2 decision making because they bring the operational problem set right. directly across. And talking to US Indo-PACOM, they, they also bring a, a very, um, uh, very grounded uh, approach um, to help us um, choose with an opportunity cost aspect to it, where to make the investments of um, finite resources, mostly people. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's easy to see the, the trends and the pillar two side of the house and opportunities for, for that. Um, but sometimes it's a little harder to see that change in the pillar one stuff. Um, however, we really need to begin leveraging advanced capabilities for advanced manufacturing, additive manufacturing, robotic welding, um, some of the technologies that's taken us a while to implement into our own processes. Um, but now that we see them coming to fruition, especially with um, future classes of submarine construction, it's really shaved off time. And since time is the other thing that keeps me up at night, um, we really need to help demonstrate from the very beginning how we can insert technology to do things smarter, faster, more efficiently, because really first time quality is, is what gets us to where we need to be. So um, insertion of technology where it makes sense, not just innovation for the sake of innovation, but actually looking at where those bottlenecks are in the process and inserting technology, whether it's AI, um, advanced manufacturing, uh, just being smart about where they're, where they're inserted into the process. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. 
So, so thank you. That's that. That concludes our series of questions. Do we have time for a few questions? Great. Well, uh, we will open it up to the audience for questions. Part of my role here in S&D is on behalf of the three universities to look at AUKUS and the opportunities over and above what the three universities are already doing. So as Matt's indicated, ASU is deeply embedded in opportunities as it relates to USDOD. Some of that aligns with AUKUS, a lot of it doesn't, and that's virtuous and appropriate in every way. King's does the same, albeit King's a different product, soft sciences, statecraft, and again, engineering, and it's got relationships, as does UNSW. When we stitch this together to form security and defence, and we do approaches to industry in terms of partnerships, education offering, short course, uh, micro-credentialism, and then you know, from 2026, we do masters and post-grad courses, and, and um, our research pathways, this is where it gets really tricky. So we're three years into AUKUS, um, HII and GD have been fantastic in terms of engagements and I've met Paul many times and we've explored the possibility of what may translate at some point. Uh, but right now, and it would be my uh, observation, bureaucracies have been so busy reorganising internally that they're not yet ready for a conversation to partner with universities and that has caused latency in terms of expectation that came out when AUKUS was first announced and what it's presenting by way of opportunity. And there's almost a lost in translation dilemma with defence industry and research over and above what is already happening when it comes to how you bring the um, hyper potential of something like S&D to a common problem. So again, you experience the challenge of, do you talk to the franchise in Australia or do you talk to the parent in the US? You talk about a workforce dilemma in Australia of 30,000 from zero by the mid to late 2030s. You've got a university with the only nuclear under a postgrad in Australia. It should be a no-brainer, comma, and yet. Uh, I find at the end of Zoom calls, I've got to crawl under my desk, cry for about 10 minutes, and then come back up again. <laughs> so my challenge is this frustration and this expectation that was initial when AUKUS was announced that there would be opportunities, for whatever reason, it is not translating yet. And now what's happening is, I think, frustration is at risk of turning into cynicism, which is at risk of turning into indifference. Mm -hmm. And once we hit the level of indifference, we're lost. Mm -hmm. And so not a question that you can provide a satisfactory answer on, but maybe some insight in terms of what we might do to be able to build and continue to build the good work that's already been done from education, from partnerships and from research, from government and from industry back towards the universities because there's also, I think in government, uh, an incorrect view that uh, universities only come with their hand out looking for money, which is not correct. Uh, but also from universities, they've got to uh, put their A game on and be able to bring to market the kind of products and services that will drive demand uh, a demand pull from industry and government, but also accelerate these objectives around AUKUS. So the question is, you know, how on government and industry side can you make it easier for research pathways to be translated into actionable outcomes quickly? Thanks. And I'll, I'm, I'm happy now, so thank you. Who wants to take that? Can I, can I jump Small in ball. on the therapy session for a minute? Okay, so I feel that um, on a deeply spiritual level, especially the under the desk and crying. Um, I think that there's two components here. So the social license piece, we need to get students interested in about working in defense um, and interested in working in nuclear and being okay with that. Uh, we've been kind of held back a little bit with some of the protesting that's been going on in the country and not quite as um, bold and proactive about being out there and being like, yeah, I work in defense, you should come join us because it's a little bit sensitive right now. Um, but being able to say industry does have jobs for you or these this is the pathway if you're coming in as an engineer This is XYZ if you do these things and we come alongside you for your entire You know university career from year one doing some mentoring and, and showing you an internship capability And then showing you what that job's going to look like at the end That's going to help drive interest into those programs So I believe that industry and academia needs to be you know lockstep with how we're progressing and University of New South Wales has been wonderful with stepping forward and I think there's an opportunity for 
uh, multiple alliances to kind of come together and, and build this system of systems to develop this workforce. That's really the only way that I, I see it working. And then um, really just the, the second piece is the, the social license and um, you know that, that all has to work in unison and in harmony to be able to generate the workforce that we need to. Obviously we can't be robbing Peter to pay Paul as far as pulling from the US and the UK systems. We're all already at capacity struggling to meet our own um, time frame. So we need to, again, use each other to, to build the, the workforce and generate the workforce all the way down to elementary and younger and getting families interested so that they see that there's a progression um, in, in defense. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on that because I, I, I agree. Um, the micro-credentialing and focus on defense um, as kind of a career in academia, I think that's fantastic. Um, but I think we spend, with our new hires, a fair amount of time um, trying to get folks to align with the mission and why the mission matters. And so I think that that's one area in, in, in those curricula where we can um, maybe augment them to start to align more closely with the mission and the why in addition to the technology and the what. Um, because I think that that's one thing, as I said, we spend a lot of energy on our new hires to get them to understand the mission and why the mission is important and the fact that lives are at stake um, and, and what it means to have a strong defense and a strong deterrence strategy. Um, so I think that that's one thing. The, the other problem, and this is an age old problem, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Um, industry tends to want to pick things up at D, not R. Right, And so how do we bridge from our closer to D to the point where it's interesting for industry to pick it up and then start to engineer it into a solution? Um, and, and that's kind of the trick. And if you think about what we've said on, on some of the Pillar 2 stuff, um, so Pillar 1, a lot of those solutions are kind of already defined, right, in terms of what's happening with Virginia, what that capability is going to be. Now, SSN AUKUS, uh, a little bit of a different story, but um, but we're not breaking physics there, right? <laughs> Pillar two, I think, is is where we're trying to do some really hard things and where there's room for R to D. Um, but from an industry perspective, it's unclear to us exactly what the priorities are. Okay, there's six or seven things listed. Yeah, got it, but what? What's the mission? What are we trying to accomplish? Because industry will start to invest in the, in the development side of things once they have a clearer picture of what the real needs and mission gaps are. And I think that it's still a little amorphous in, in Pillar 2, at least from my perspective. And I may, be, I may be just out of touch, but I don't think it's getting communicated out from government yet to a point where industry can latch on and say, let's go focus here and let's make that investment. So uh, that's a, a perspective at least. So the uh, workforce and so defense, US defense, we make a lot of um, investments uh, in people, um, getting them into schools, um, off giving them jobs, giving them summer work, giving them then careers, um, because we're looking for the technical expertise, the, the support, the fiscal support for national security as the career they want to go into. Uh, and we have a lot of programs that do just that. And not to your point, it's not the university is asking for funds. That's us recognizing the issue uh, and going after it. Microelectronics uh, in, is a very is a critical industry for us, and uh, not AUKUS at the moment. Um, but when you look at uh, some of the comments by the Department of Commerce Secretary about how many engineers will be required in the US for the onshore fabs that we're now paying for, it's a, it's a huge number. Um, and that's at the keep the plants working level. Um, we're talking also about the people who are going to innovate the new designs or come up with the exotic new combinations of materials. We want them in the schools working. Sorry. Um, when it th then also in the, the research aspects of universities, um, I mentioned the maritime big play and other things going on in AUKUS now as a really interesting source of data. Um, in the way that a lot of grad students would, or postdocs would just die to get their hands on, we can provide those data um, into the three systems. Um, 
very valuable to us, very valuable, I'm sure, for the new designs for you. Um, when we talk about the, some of the torpedo work, for example, we're doing some things there that is new and isn't just an engineering activity, it's a, oh, we don't know how to do this activity. So a lot of opportunities there coming up. The, the larger picture in terms of operational needs, that's being driven by the combatant commands. So again, we have these lists internally, but back to your point about classification and other things, it's how to get it out and where to get it out to in a way that's fair right. to industry or industries in the three countries. Um, one of the ways that we bridge um, results from schools, universities, um, into um, product and services is we watch the faculty and students spin out new companies. Um, back wearing a DARPA hat, there's, there's companies all the time. We DARPA pays for the, the science and technology to be done, vets it hard, bangs it around, it works. Um, but just taking that out, because you've got the best widget, doesn't mean say you've got the best company. And it's a lot of spin outs, um, and you have to protect them. <coughs> um, not in terms of legislation, the, the, there are things like CFIUS in the back, but in terms of, well, this great idea and this IP, and maybe somebody else's capital that you don't want is going to be in there investing and owning it. So the department has some various mechanisms. So in DARPA itself, there's the Embedded Entrepreneurship Initiative that works to help that. And one of the new things that um, uh, Michu got underway in the last two years is the Office of Strategic Capital um, in, the, in, in the Department of Defense, which is, in a sense, um, de-risking the loans, de-risking investments of others into technologies of importance to defense, some of which come from schools, some of which come from businesses. Um, and it's a, it was a, it's a very clever idea. So it, that's then workforce all the way up to getting things underway. Um, after that point, there are business, and business is, and there's a whole other ecosystem out there for large enterprises. It's still paying attention to, solve, no, um, but, but actively working it in a lot of different places. Thank you. So let's do, we have time probably for t one more lightning round question. So I saw this gentleman first. And then we can connect afterwards. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Jack Rapansky, unaffiliated. Um, I'm just wondering uh, how, how we should think about AUKUS in terms of, say, comparing it to uh, the Apollo space program or, or the Manhattan Project or the Polaris sub-missile program. Once you're finished with this Virginia sub and whatever current things you're currently working on in Pillar 2, uh, is there a sense of kind of planning for the next uh, missions beyond that? Or is this just a, like a one-time thing and then maybe AUKUS will disband in 10 years or something? Because since the, poly, since the uh, point of this whole uh, forum is kind of looking at the next 10 years, so where will AUKUS be in 10 years? Well, I can take that really quick. So once you commit to nuclear power submarines, that's a lifetime commitment. So mm -hmm. it's not like you just get it and then decide you're through with it in 10 years. That's not how it works. So this is a long-term commitment um, that is going to span hundreds of years. Yeah. Any, any idea of what might follow Virginia after the initial sub? Oh, of course. So SSN AUKUS is in development. So that'll be the, the build that'll happen in Australia, all the facilities and infrastructure to go along with it. It's a full cradle to grave, you know, next multi-generational opportunity. Chris, would you, would you like to add something? Yeah, no, I, I agree. SSN AUKUS is the next generation, and that's going to, I mean, we're building submarines now that will last for 75 to 80 years, right? They'll be out there deployed. So... Uh, we are talking a long game here. Um, and I guess the other thing just quickly, you know, different than Apollo, different than strategic uh, mission in that there's, there's a, a lot less basic physics involved here, right? I mean, there, we know how to do what we're doing, but we're bringing it to a different domain, to a different set of constraints, to a different set of requirements, right? And so that's the challenge is, is similar in that it's step function change, but it's not on the technical side. It's not on the research and development side, in my mind, 
largely. It's more on the policy, it's more on the um, international uh, relationship side. So we're breaking China in a different spot, no pun intended there. Um, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> like to wrap up for us? <laughs> Just talking, talking pillar two. Um, it's not, in the, it's no, no, nothing in pillar two is in the sense of one and done. Um, it's gonna, it's the beauty of uh, making your work uh, around research projects or, or research development procurement projects is they have a start and they have a finish. They have waypoints, they have milestones. Um, and if it's not performing, you kill it. But that end point says you don't just keep doing it forever just because you, that's what you've been doing. That's why the working groups uh, moving to the background, projects coming before, there's always going to be a set of overlapping projects. And I'm watching internally uh, the project proposals coming forward are increasing in ambition, not, not small R&D, mm -hmm. but actually pretty interesting stuff. And it's, it's hugely encouraging. Is it, right. is it like the Berkeley program? Like, like right, so frame, framed, think of it as like uh, IARPA or DARPA programs. So four to five years period and then within that, you get the results or you don't. If you don't, you've killed it early and you put the resources elsewhere. Yep, you bet. Thanks, Gail. Great. One day, really interesting back um, <laughs> I have a back to win. <laughs> uh, really quickly, I think we're over time. Excuse me, really quick. Uh, 1.2 subs a year, the maximum capacity right now of your yards, Chris and Ashley. Uh, a lot of the concern that's not enough to meet our requirements, US requirements, Australian requirements. How are you overcoming the barriers to meet that target? Ooh, that's, a, that's for Newport News to answer, but really integrating, inserting technology where we can and being mindful of uh, the commitments we've made. That's really why our Mission Technologies Division is engaged in the on-the-ground work in AUKUS and not Newport News Shipbuilding. So we're of the shipyard, but not the shipyard, not taking away from what's going on there. That's why you're here too, right? <laughs> and and I, I absolutely will not speak for electric boat, but if you look at what the U.S. Navy is saying and what they're doing, right, from a submarine industrial base investment uh, from an uplift associated with AUKUS, international uplift. Um, the strategy is clear, is we need to increase that supply chain, both, both um, CONUS and OCONUS, to allow us to grow to the numbers that we need to grow to. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, as I interpret the Navy policy, again, not speaking for electric boat, but that's what I think the U.S. Navy is trying to do. All right, Ashley, Chris, Peter, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.